Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Well, the Senate and the National Council for Women's Society have called for the inclusion of domestic workers in the proposed 70,000 Naira national minimum wage scheme. This was discussed during a public hearing on a bill for the domestication and registration of domestic workers and employers, sponsored by Senator Bambangi Dafusieni. Senator Osita Izuna saw emphasized that domestic workers should receive the same minimum wage as the lowest public workers. He suggested that the bill should ensure this inclusion and focus on the registration and protection of domestic workers and their employers. Acting National President of NCWS, Mrs. Geraldine Etuk, also argued for the inclusion of domestic workers in the national minimum wage law. This position received broad support from various stakeholders, including the Minister of Labor. Senator Husseini acknowledged the widespread support for the bill, but expressed concerns about the practical implementation of the law. He highlighted the need for an agency, likely driven by the Ministry of Labor and Productivity, to ensure the effective execution of the proposed law. Now, joining us to discuss this is Biodun Shoumi, is a public affairs analyst. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome, so sir. we're talking about the minimum wage and having to include um, domestic workers into this. So, of course, um, the, the lowest figure that someone should be earning in Nigeria is of 70,000 naira. And now with domestic workers being a part of this, because, of course, it's also employment, um, they are asking that they also get that same amount. But I want to ask, well, how practical do you think this can be, especially when some of these domestic workers are not being registered. Imagine having a household and someone is coming from a village. Nobody knows who this person is. How are, how are we sure that, um, you know, is going to be executed? How practical it is for people to pay their domestic workers the same amount? Um, yes, um, in the first system, there are three types of domestic workers. Mm -hmm. One, you have those, um, part-time domestic workers who move in, for instance, to do laundry, uh, do house cleaning you know, for two, three, four hours a day, and then um, they go back to their house. They are not covered by the minimum wage. And um, the, the minimum wage act um, promulgated in 1981 excludes you know, part-time workers like that. Then you have a second set who are more or less working um, for 40 hours a week or more, they are well covered you know, under the minimum wage because they are domestic workers. Then you have the third one, which is the resident workers. The resident domestic workers are working almost 24 hours um, for a fixed amount of money. They also will be covered under, domestic, um, under the minimum wage act. But in practice, what we see is that even governments have not been, state governments have not been able to implement the minimum wage to the full in many states, uh, simply because it's about the ability to pay. It's important. You cannot pay, you cannot have a wage bill that you can't afford to pay. The bottom line is you will have to retrench. And many people would rather stay in employment for um, whatever it is below the minimum wage than being unemployed. Now, in the case of domestic workers, we already know we have a huge army of domestic workers, uh, particularly caregivers who, uh, both for adults and children, who are more or less having to live in, 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 in the home where care is provided. So they, on their own part, deserve even a lot more than the 70,000. The question is this, is about ability to pay. Many people would rather if they can't afford to pay uh, domestic workers, we'd rather not have them. And what does that mean? We'll have another army of uh, uh, unemployed people joining mm -hmm. the already overburdened uh, unemployed uh, uh, population in the in the country. So a lot of it, some of it may not be practical. In the case of um, places outside the urban centers where you have domestic workers, some of them are even being paid as low as 18,000 Naira. And that's what they're getting. So I can't even see those ones being paid 30,000, not to talk of 70,000 mm Naira. -hmm. The reason is pretty clear. If you don't have the money to pay, you will not be able to pay it. If you don't engage those domestic workers, you will not be liable to do that. And the last thing we want now is another army of unemployed people. 
Yes, it is right to register domestic workers because people need to be able to trace them. Individually, we tried to identify uh, where is this person coming from or getting yeah. to know them through someone else. But the fact of the matter is we now have uh, many fellow West Africans moving into Nigeria and some of them are actually engaged in domestic work and we do not have enough data or information of them. If anything happens, it's extremely difficult for law enforcement agencies to be able to track them. So within that context, I think it is right to register the domestic workers. Now, when we're talking about people who are covered by the minimum wage, it, it gets a little bit foggy. Uh, let's take, for instance, the people who sweep the roads. Uh, they may not be employed directly by the government. It, it may be a contract uh, that was taken by a company and then subletting it also. I don't know how, what language they use. And then they employ these people and then pay from what the government pays to them. Mm -hmm. Now, in the minimum wage, will the minimum wage cover them when it's going to the contractor or it covers them as they are on the streets, so to speak. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yes, I do. There are three components um, in contracts like that involving, um, uh, how do I put it? In, in, in um, uh, devolved services, I'm trying to look for the, uh, uh, the appropriate one. In the, pro in, in the provided services, mm. um, like um, the cleaning, um, the fact of the matter is they are always on contracts and there are three elements to that contract, which is the cost element, you know, the cost of the direct provision of that service. You have the second element, which is the management fees, on, which is based on the services or on the number of people employed to provide that services. And you have the third element, which is the tax on the management fees. On the minimum wage, is increased, you know, or has been increased like what we have now to 70,000. Uh, many of those contractors are bound to go into negotiations with those who contract them with a view to reflect the minimum wage because um, that would be the position of the law. It's the law. And number two, because there are state government services which are being provided, uh, the state governments would have no choice but to agree to that. And the third element is they themselves would make much more money from the management fees based on the contract um, sum. So therefore, um, they, are, they will be covered, in my view. And I cannot see any state government saying or, uh, I mean, refusing to uh, implement the minimum wage, at least in states that we know can afford to pay. But do you also uh, think, um, like some of the governors are saying, that they should uh, be allowed to choose how much they are going to pay. NLC was coming uh, or came out to say uh, minimum wage is a national thing. The states decide what they can pay above minimum wage, but this, uh, the governors were arguing that they needed to go back and uh, think of what they can pay as states, as individual states. Uh, even though the federal government has announced the 70,000 Naira, some states, I'm sure, will go back on their words or will go back and say, okay, we cannot pay 70,000 even though it's a federal government. So, or even owe salaries. Yes. Yeah, so what do you think can be done in, event of, uh, in that kind of event? Yeah, frankly speaking, we should not even be talking about a national minimum wage or a wage negotiated you know, on behalf of each state government. Each state is endowed differently. There are resources, you know, the IGR uh, generated are totally different. The allocation totally different. So when states are not being paid or making the same amount of money, they cannot be expected, you know, to also um, pay the same amount of money. In a proper, true federalism, state governments are supposed to be federating units. The center is the federal government, which is uh, part of the federating unit. So therefore, each state should be able to determine what they can pay in a proper, true federalism, in line with the principles and theory and practice of federalism. But what we have in Nigeria is totally different. We have a situation where there is a law, the Minimum Wage Act of 1981, stipulating that this has to be agreed nationally. I don't see what is wrong with that, provided the states can afford to pay. The problem is this. You have a situation where the federal government controls 52.68% of the 
of federal allocation when the states, all the 36 states, are getting 26%. If you crunch the figures, states not collecting the derivation, you know, all the derivation of 13%, you know, will end up with about 0.78%, less than 1%. So how do you expect a state collecting less than 1% of federal allocation to be in a position to pay the same amount of money as the federal government collecting 52.68%? You know, this is part of the anomalies, and that's why people are calling, uh, saying that uh, we need to put down the responsibilities of the federal government with a view to ensure that states take more responsibilities and they have more resources in order to discharge their function. So it's a very strong argument for uh, restructuring. But as it is currently, under the current situation, even when the minimum wage was 30,000 naira, not all the state governments were able to pay. Yeah. Till now, even the private sector covered by the minimum wage, many of them... Uh, Mr. Shaomi, would you really say not all the states were able to pay or not all the states wanted to pay? Mm. Because the that's the question now. Have. Even now that it is 70,000, I'm sure the federal government knows mm. how much they give to the states and how much they could use that money to, mm -hmm. to, to do. And but they can decide not before, to. Yeah, before they said 70,000. So is it that the states were not able... The operative word here is able, able to pay, or that they, they failed or did not want to pay. Um, I won't look at it that way. You need to look at it uh, broadly. It's a more complex issue than uh, looking at it the way you are seeing it. Um, let me give you a good example. You have a state made up of um, uh, two or two or two, uh, a four million population, and then they are collecting three point five million, you know, as a federal allocation. And when they get the 3.5 billion, crunch the figures and see how much is it per head that should go to each uh, um, each um, resident of that state. When in reality, the minimum wage is just about those who are in employment. Workers in employment in that state may not be more than 500,000. So other services which other people are not covered or who are not employed or who are self-employed needs to benefit from must be provided for education. We all know that the all our um, um, government schools are not, you know, are, are partly being subsidized. You know, they are partly being funded because they are seen as social responsibilities. The you cannot charge the same amount of money as in the private sector, you know, for education. So the full cost of education itself is being subvented. Same thing for policing. Same thing for government. You know, and so many other issues. Same thing for hospitals, sanitation which has to be uh, catered for road provision because everybody will enjoy all that. Everything cannot just go to 500,000 workers in a state. If you crunch those figures, you will realize that it's just roughly uh, how much will each person be entitled to. So government has to function for everybody, not only workers in formal employment, including yeah. those who are unemployed must benefit from federal allocation. So this is the complexity of the issue. When you talk about state government, they have other responsibilities which must be funded to the benefit of everyone resident in that state. So that is why some states will say, look, yes, we are collecting federal allocation, but you cannot use the old money to pay workers. What about other uh, residents? Workers are not in the majority. What about other people? Are they not entitled to part of this federal allocation? That is the complexity of this um, situation i don't know so, so I don't know because, sorry i don't know because uh, uh, in my state for instance uh, they say they collect they are no longer a um, collecting money as a, an oil producing state so their location is very small and then the governor went at one point to china with all his commissioners and yeah, SAs so. to go and study bamboo Mm. How, to, how to, to use bamboo till date. We don't know anything that, was, uh, that that knowledge was used for. Mm. And people will see this, and then the governor will still say that there are other things that I'm trying to There's meet. no money. There's mm. no money. Anyway, so talking about the, um, this domestic workers, the minimum wage, um, let's talk about implementation. How are we sure that you know, states will actually pay these people, and even for the domestic workers as well? How can they claim their rights? For instance, um, I've been said to get at least 70,000, or that's the least I should be paid. But there are still some people that would not pay these monies. So what happens then? What do you do? Who do you report to? How do you claim your rights to the same amount that is for everybody? Meanwhile, you're probably not just getting it. 
Yes, um, you have two issues here. The first one is, when you employ somebody, are you employing them on wages or on salary? Mm. Wages is very clear, they are paid per hour. If you're employing somebody on salary, they are not on wages. So those are two clear issues, which again, uh, it may end up in industrial courts, you know, to, to resolve. Mm. The second issue is, um, is about ability to pay. For instance, if I cannot afford to pay um, a domestic worker 70,000 naira, the only option I have is to let them go. You know, fire them. When you fire them, what about the consequences, you know, for society, the social consequences of unemployment? Um, would that person rather not take less amount of money than the minimum wage and still be in employment than being out, uh, out of employment? But you isn't know, that trying to twist people. their arm? Mm -hmm. Isn't that trying to twist their arm to ensure that they, they take whatever amount you're going to throw to it's them? It's blackmail. Yeah. Like, if you lose this one, you're not mm -hmm. getting any So you, it's better for you to stay in employment so that you can just get these peanuts that I'm going to give you. Yeah, Especially knowing that, that there is a law that states they should be paid a certain amount. I don't see it as blackmail. It's a matter of choice. Mm. the decision for individual workers to take. Of course, the employers of domestic workers will be exposed to one thing, which is um, being sued you know, in, the, in the industrial court. How many of these domestic workers can afford the cost of legal representation to start with? That is the problem. If, how do you enforce it? When it comes to enforcement, a worker whose right is being breached cannot, does not have the resources to hire a lawyer how do you expect them to be protected? That is one. Number two, those affected also have a choice to say, look, I don't need a domestic worker. In the same way, if you push a state government that cannot afford to pay, what they simply would do is to rationalize their workforce. They would downsize. When we downsize, what then happens? There will be more people out of employment than what we have currently. The economy is seriously challenged as it is currently. We don't want to grow an army of unemployed people. I support the idea of minimum wage, but we also need to solve that problem of the inability to pay by looking you know, at the structure of our federation. We need to restructure the true federalism so that these states can generate the resources, retain those resources, to be able to not only pay minimum wage, but also provide for all uh, the citizens. What is the point, for instance, in federal government controlling an agricultural budget that is probably more than the, the entire budget of the taxes states of the Federation, when in reality it is the states that own the land. So we need to look at what we're doing, look at the structure of this country, and then restructure the in a way that the state will be able to afford to meet its obligations to people. <laughs> in relation to private companies and individuals, it's extremely very difficult to enforce, because simply because they will tell you they are putting them on salaries, they are not on wages. So how do you tell the difference? Mm. The minimum wage act only covers uh, wages, not salaries. That's the problem. So there are issues to be resolved through the industrial court eventually. Mm. Well, we hope that, um, I mean, at the end of the day, every laborer should get a good um, wage, a good money, the, a good salary that comes for you, especially if you know that that's the way you have to put food on your table and the table for your families. So um, with the Senate telling the federal government to include domestic workers, of course, they also have families. They need to be able to cater for them as well. And everyone, so from the private sector to the public sector, um, everyone should just be able to get something that is substantial for them and we hope that Nigeria the economy in Nigeria will um, be better and so we will not be having back and forth and conversations about this and everyone will be fine and in the end anyways Biodo, we want to say thank you for coming it's always a pleasure having you on our program thank you so much thank you for having me thank you all right, we've been speaking with Biodun Shomi. He's a public affairs analyst. And we've just been speaking on the fact that the Senate has asked the federal government to include domestic workers in the minimum wage. This is where we have to wrap it up on the show today. Thank you so much for having breakfast with us. My name is Rume Paulson. And I am Nyamgu Agadi. Let's do it again tomorrow. Have an amazing day.